I am not a cabbage patch kid. I am a kimchi patch kid. That is better. My gut is probably better than those bloated cheek cabbage patch kids. It's actually something that I've wondered a lot. And funny enough, I was working on a larger topic that talked about sauerkraut and kimchi and realized that, wow, this deserves its own video because I've wondered this. Like I actually eat a fair bit of sauerkraut and I eat a fair bit of kimchi. I'm biased towards kimchi because of the taste, but I was always kind of wondering the research. Both of them have good amounts of research. Now, you probably know this, but sauerkraut is a fermented cabbage, right? And a simple brine, very, very basic. Whereas kimchi is a more advanced sauerkraut with other spices and sometimes radish and sometimes other fermentable like uh, cruciferous compounds. So it's pretty wild, right? There's a lot of stuff going on there. Makes it a little bit harder to extrapolate specific mechanistic actions because there's cayenne pepper, there's all kinds of things in kimchi. Okay, but with sauerkraut, it's pretty straightforward. So let's start with sauerkraut. We'll kind of balance it out with the kimchi discussion. So today's video sponsor is Thrive Market. I put a link down below. They're an online membership-based grocery store. So no matter what kind of diet you're doing, like if you're vegan or maybe you're trying paleo or maybe you just want to go gluten-free, they have something for everybody. And you can sort by different diet type. You can sort by category. It's like isolating exactly what you need from a grocery store and then being able to get it delivered to your doorstep in a couple days. So totally epic. And that link below, because they are a sponsor, is going to get you 25% off of your initial order as well as a free gift. So that link is down below and a thank you to Thrive Market for supporting this channel. So there was a study that was published in the journal Food and Function. It was a random double blind study. Okay, and it was done on sauerkraut. They gave subjects 75 grams of unpasteurized sauerkraut. Okay, and then they gave them pasteurized sauerkraut as sort of a control. But ultimately what they found is with the sauerkraut, these subjects had suffered from IBS. They found that IBS seemed to improve, like constipation seemed to chill out, diarrhea seemed to balance out, like things were better, right? So it's wild though, because when you look at the rest of the research and you look at how they actually were able to survey the microbiome, there wasn't much actual change in the microbiome for the people that consume the sauerkraut. And when we look at fermented foods, as I've discussed in other videos, like fermented foods, the main benefit is supposed to be the fact that they are probiotic. But there was a study published in the journal uh, Nutrients back in 2019. It had demonstrated that the only fermented food that could officially be classified as a probiotic seemed to be dairy-based. So that would be like yogurt and kefir. So we can't necessarily call sauerkraut probiotic, but it's still intriguing. Why did they see improvements even though their gut biome didn't change? Well, one hypothesis is that, okay, the sauerkraut seemed to give them uh, sort of this perceived improvement, like a perceived health effect. We think something's healthy and psychosomatically it can actually improve, sort of like a placebo effect. Okay, the other side of the equation is cabbage itself is prebiotic. So that has a benefit too, right? That can potentially have a benefit on short chain fatty acid production. That could have a benefit in a lot of different ways, but it probably would be measurable as well when you're looking at the gut microbiome. So it's a little bit confusing with that. But one thing that's very intriguing with sauerkraut is that sauerkraut, the brine itself in studies, when they actually just give the brine, there seems to be an improvement in glutathione scores. So more glutathione, more antioxidant activity. Could have something to do with what's called campferol. Okay, campferol is a compound that seems to improve the expression of antioxidant enzymes and has that effect there. So maybe there's some other health attributes, but the other thing is, yeah, you've got straight up cabbage. So it does have interesting things in it though, like uh, indole 3 carbonyl, like dindole methane, which can help estrogen modulation by helping out the liver metabolize what's called 1,7-hydroxyestradiol. So we have that working in our favor. But then we have good old kimchi. Okay, the research with kimchi is a little bit more powerful as it seems to actually have a potential probiotic effect. Now with kimchi, you have a wide variety of ingredients, but you also have a wide variety of bacteria. There's more bacteria going into kimchi than there is in sauerkraut. Okay, so you have a, a diverse amount and it's fermented for a long period of time. But what we've seen is after like three days of fermentation, kimchi really ends up being dominated by leuconostaca, a specific kind, a specific strain of bacteria, no matter what kind you make, right? So there's a study that was published in the journal Functional Foods, and it was intriguing because it looked at two different kinds of kimchi. They made two different ways with two different spices, two different sets of ingredients, okay? Well, they found that at the end of the study, both forms of kimchi had a nice effect 
on increasing what are called short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria. So short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria are what we want. Okay, when we take probiotics, when we do things that are good for our gut, when we eat lots of veggies, we are trying to produce more butyrate producers, more propionate producers, things like that. Things that are really the bacteria that produce short chain fatty acids because that means we're actually having a systemic sort of whole system effect by our gut microbiome changing. So the fact that we were able to see this with this Kim Chi study is very promising. But then when you get down to the nitty gritty, you find, well, it's really difficult to elucidate what's triggering the effect. Or is it the ingredients? Is it the garlic? Is it the onion that's in kimchi? Or is it the fermentation process? I'm leaning more towards sort of the prebiotic effect coming from the onion, coming from the garlic. And I say that because when you look at the research, you can see that the two different kinds of kimchi had slightly differing impacts on the gut microbiome. Although we don't know why or what, we do know that, well, this one with different spices had a different effect than this one. So there's a lot to factor in. But I guess when you're looking at the entire big picture here, you see, yes, kimchi has more to offer. So if you were weighing out kimchi over sauerkraut, yes, there seems to be a gut microbiome benefit. Whereas sauerkraut, maybe you're getting the antioxidant sort of estrogen modulation effects, but without the potential for short chain fatty acid producing bacteria. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and don't watch too much Cabbage Patch Kids.